Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we have this uh, occasion to discuss some of the work of a very important artist who, uh, who works between New York, Dhaka, and London, Naim Mohamed, whom uh, I've been, I'm Jivesh from Lux Media Collective. I've been following his work for over last about 15 years now, almost 2006, we met uh, in a conference where his initial, the big, the big project which occupied him for four or five years, the disappearance project he was showing, which was uh, after the whole, you know, the turbulence of the post September 11 Afghanistan war, there was this trans transformation. And that's, that's the first decade of, the, but I will have this discussion because you could have seen Jolly Dobina, that is the film that the IFF is showing. What I will do is try to uh, bring into discussion uh, two other works of mine, one made in 2011 and one made in 2017, two 2020 Jolly Dobina, with of which I know a little more in the making of the work because I was part of the commissioning team that brought the uh, work into uh, supported the work and uh, made it possible. So I'm pretty happy uh, that we could do that together. So what I will try to do is uh, take this 10 years of work that Naim did in 2011 onwards. And I think there's a very significant body of work got made. Uh, I have seen most of it uh, in the art context or, uh, or rather in the art context. And now with Yokohama, it was uh, seeing it uh, here, but I did uh, see a full scale screening in Delhi. Uh, but it's been all in art context. And, but this is a discussion uh, with viewers who are primarily not in the art context, but they're aware of the, con the work being generated in the art context. And uh, they're looking at art artists who are making films uh, and who are making films that have a structure which are now being absorbed and extended within the uh, within the film festival format. So there is a movement that is happening between uh, filmmakers who, who moved into art context and their work now entering uh, film festival. So in that context, I will uh, try to draw certain threads so that we can enjoy Jolly Devona's uh, preoccupation, his, his aesthetic choice, his rhythms, the way it structures time and way it structures life. Uh, so first, uh, there are three works. What I'm taking is one is the United Red Army, which is made in 2011, which is about a hostage situation of a Japan airline plane in Dhaka airport. You can Google it. It's a very, very, very uh, important moment uh, in the history of aviation. And uh, what uh, Naim does is that you see this, uh, he's eight year old. We know that he says it articulates his obsession with TV and everything. But what he does is that he stages a moment of stasis. And the stasis is that the, a plane is immobilized and there are many scripts around it that unfolds. So the script is of the, of the hijacker, the script, there's, there's a kind of an unfolding script from the side of the Bangladeshi uh, uh, negotiator. And then there is the script around the multiplicity of other protagonists. And what we have in a world historical moment being shaped, which is shaping other world historical moment. And what we have is that multiplying scripts of which there is a beautiful uh, line which says, that one of the protagonists do not know the story in a sense that the scripts are independent of each other. They are unfolding in the background of each other. So I take this, this is a kind of a, to me, this is what uh, Naim can, Naim scripts very well, that this multiple scripts parallelly operating. And then there is this implicit tension and breakdown between the script in an each stage and he's able to, think through a moment in which the things are brought in stasis. The, the hostage crisis is a classic classic world historical stasis. What happens in this, in this hours that unfold? But what it does interestingly is that it, it is in the stasis he looks at the world historical again. So I will just ask Naim to 
to kind of bring us a little bit alert to this question of what is the stasis on the status of the stasis in your thinking thank you jibesh for the um great introduction and a nice way to go back to 2011. if i can just go back a little bit further also you mentioned uh, when we first met uh, which was at a conference uh it was in uh, germany at studio schule and um i remember one thing that had a very sharp impression on me this is in 2006 is that um at the conference table should then monica were sitting here and then you were sitting at a different place in the table i think so that you're a trio but you're not sitting together and then everybody else had a very sort of um one person presenting one thing walid rather invited me he's presenting i'm presenting we all have our printouts uh you know our eight by eleven and then um, monica had a book shuddha had a book and i think you had and each of you had these books with little pieces of paper stuck in there multicolored, and uh, very seamlessly, Monica would read a little bit and then just close the book and then Shuddha would pick it up and then you would pick it up. So there was this back and forth going on, which appeared to be unscripted, mm -hmm. but must have had some planning. Otherwise, how would you not stumble over each other? And, uh, you know, there are, I mean, there are collectives that we've all experienced. You mentioned the collective that I was part of at the time, Visible Collective. Um, and as you know, as, as I've experienced, collectives are hard to keep going because after a certain time, that sort of collectivity starts to fray and people have their own project and own scripts. And in a way, it's a way for me to think about this project as well, because um, it was a film made starting from a completely different premise. And then it went somewhere else once new people entered um, the scene. And I think somehow for me, that 2006 encounter of collectivity and my way of making this film uh, somehow there's an overlap um, united red army um, which the title also in case anyone googles it there's also a japanese film by the same title which i wasn't aware of at the time that i made my film so in japan it's a frequent slippage that there's a japanese film with the exact same title which is also about this group but not about this hijack but a completely different incident um, it started from a very um Bangladesh centric, I mean, and then the film is still about Bangladesh, but it came from a very Bangladesh centric view of, you know, this hijack that I knew about. My father was in the military, so he was a doctor, and therefore there was a connection through that. Uh, the chief of the Air Force at the time, uh, A.G. Mahmood, was a colleague of my father, and they're also from that generation that were the first group to be trained in what was then still Pakistan. So they're East Pakistanis trained by the Pakistan army, highly aware of their status as Bengalis within a Pakistan army that's dominated by non-Bengalis. I think Bengali representation was less than 5% in the army of United Pakistan. But these were also the few achievers, which is why they were posted in West Pakistan. So there's this pre-1971 Bangladesh history, Bangladesh as an entity called East Pakistan, which generally sort of erased, that was also in the backdrop. That's why my father and the Air Force chief were colleagues because there were so few Bengalis at the time so you knew each other and then that carried over, carries over into independent Bangladesh where a new country is created and then suddenly people who were junior officers suddenly get elevated because there are not enough Bengali officers so they're part of this history as well of this sudden opening up of opportunities after 1971 which uh, older family members of mine compared to 1947 that after 1947 in West Bengal, there's one kind of experience with a massive refugee influx, but in East Bengal, which becomes East Pakistan, then Bangladesh, there's actually an opening up of opportunities for the middle class because suddenly there are not enough uh, Bengali Muslims who've gone through the Indian civil service. So all of this is somewhere in the backdrop. And it's a very Bangladesh centric story that I'm pursuing of, oh, this hijack that happened that was very, very important for Bangladesh because we were at the center of the world stage. And that's how the Air Force talks about it as well. It was a moment when the world's eyes are on Bangladesh and not in the context of you know, poverty or relief, but as being in the middle of this chess game. And then the deeper I got into it, the more I realized how much the Bangladeshis were not protagonists of their own story. Um, in the sense that from the United States point of view, the only thing that mattered was that there were four American passengers, including one person who was a US congressman. Uh, not a significant one, but at the time he's a U.S. congressman on a hijacked plane, so that's very significant. There's an American actress who was an understudy for Barbara Streisand. So those are the important matters for them. Uh, there's a Japanese documentary about this hijack made around the same time, 
which spends a great deal of time actually with a phone call to the White House by one of the hostages who's trying to get the White House to intervene. So from for them, uh, for the American story, it's just those four passengers, nobody else exists. For the Japanese government, of course, it's the Japanese passengers first and foremost. And then the Bangladeshis, as the film points out, have their own internal struggle going on, which is that a hijack has happened in a country that from the outside appears stable in 1977, but inside is very, very unstable. And one of the ironies of this moment, there are many ironies stacked on top of each other, but one of the ironies is that some of the sources of instability are the last uh, tendrils of left tendencies inside the military. Um, you know, the various left tendencies that came about after the creation of Bangladesh, dissatisfied with the government that comes to power, thinking that, no, this wasn't the promised revolution. The civilian side of those left tendencies have generally been crushed by 76 or so. But the military tendencies, the underground cells inside the military that are modeling themselves after uh, Maoist strands broadly, with an idea that since we couldn't take the country, we couldn't take power through the normal path, we're going to go through the military. The last fragments of those are basically crushed in 77. And this, uh, this military coup that happens inside Bangladesh at the same time as the hijack is one of the last expressions. So it's it, in very broad terms, you could say it's some sort of left sympathetic coup. Um, it's impossible to say exactly what the nature was going to be because they never get to power, so you don't know what they would be. So I think that's like one of the um, paralleling going on. You, uh, the Japanese Red Army has hijacked this plane in solidarity with the Palestinian cause and world revolution. And he says at some point, when Japan is no longer an imperialist country, you and I will meet again. So there's that idea that Japan, Japan is some sort of apex of American supported capitalist development. And this group intends to overthrow that government from exile. And they run head on into this left tendency inside Bangladesh that has no idea about who's in the plane. The people in the plane have no idea what's going on on the ground. And they both carry out their parallel actions. Um, and and the, 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 these juxtapositions appeared to me as I started digging. And I kept running into these situations where, you know, if you look in the Japanese archives, it's seen in a completely different way from the way it's seen in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, it's all about the coup. Um, the hijack has faded. Uh, the lead negotiator from the Bangladesh side ends up resigning um, from the Air Force, even though he successfully concludes that negotiation. So these were, you know, some of the strands that were going on. I think if I could, um, you know, you said, what's the status of the stasis? I, I feel there were all these tendencies that were in collision with each other that should theoretically have known about each other, but actually didn't. It's almost like two different left militant tendencies um, collide on a runway because of the fact of the people inside the plane carrying out a hijack in the name of world revolution and the people on the airport who are trying to carry out a coup in the name of local revolution um, and both in some ways fail in different ways. Yeah, those were some of the initial things that just kind of came out. Um, and a lot of it, I mean, I had a completely different film plan, completely different film that I proposed to the Sharjah Biennial a year and a half before the Biennial. And by the time I finished, I had met all these people and all these strange things that opened up. So that became a completely different film. Yeah, because uh, I, I bring this film up because there is the kind of a halting. In that halting, all the different forces are kind of, can be almost, can you can almost x-ray the forces at play. And then they will collide, some will vanish, some will liquidate it. So in, in that sense, it's a, a, a kind of, so, but then I, why I bring this up, I will talk later because I think I will bring it up for a very different reason. And then we come to uh, Tripoli cancel. Tripoli cancel is where you have this airport completely abandoned and somebody was staying there almost for a decade. And, and I found that a fascinating it's a decade it's a decade after the crash you know 2007 eight crash and you were doing a work in 2017 it's a kind of a kind of a momentary stasis is also abandoned but this man rehearses life he almost play acting rehearsing life and rehears, rehearsing very large world historical moments he rehearses hannah harent he rehearses the concentration camp he rehearses traffics he rehearses personal life uh, all acting and acting to act in the world, you have to continuously play act a memory. Uh, because 
that because the and actually almost live as if the daily life is being achieved and lived again and again. So he has mm-hmm. walked this uh, abandoned landscape uh, for 10 years, daily basis. And yet he's not tired. And yet what is thing that he rehearses all the different large movement of large uh, transfer kind of movements of people and large encounters. So in this, in the in that where the stasis is the inertial point becomes at one level a massive withdrawal from the transition narrative because it's a transit you know mm-hmm. and we all coming from very global south are located in various transition narratives you know half complete half you know always half you know and that's and suddenly blocking that transition narrative you say that okay there is no transition narrative here we the transit is gone because there is no transit, you are located. And then you rehearse and play act or act all kinds of memories. So in that sense, it's, a, it's here, it's not an analytical moment. It's almost a refusal to move in the way one would uh, think movement is produced, like you move. So I, I thought it was interesting that in 2011, the hostage crisis allows you a entry while well, something has brought, brought into standstill and then you discover. And then by 2017, you have actually moved into a very, uh, almost a personalized archeology span of landscape denying transit and then rehearsing a old world historical memory. So would you say that there is a certain uh, uh, kind of a, kind of place, nest, nest to thought that appears? Uh, from 2011 to 2017? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I fundamentally try to be optimistic, not necessarily in the films, just in life. But, you know, you're constantly running into these situations. We are in this world historical moment where we wonder if we are at the, at a point where we're in a post hope situation. Uh, I mean, I don't truly believe that. I always believe in uh, injecting new optimistic meanings into even what seems like a devastated landscape. I mean, 2011, it didn't come up, but 2011 was a year of Occupy Wall Street. And there was a moment uh, where there's an Arab Spring at the same time. So it seemed like a moment of a lot of hope, the turning of history, now something new is opening. And then, of course, as we know, uh, that doesn't quite turn into what we hoped. You know, Occupy is crushed in European capitals and the Arab Spring becomes, you know, in a turn of phrase, the uh, Libyan winter in some ways, um, you know, and then of course we, our generation is living in the aftermath of the end of the promise of socialism. Um, and so we're living in a time when hope has to be inserted into new things, which hasn't been found yet. Um, I think this person, as I had envisioned him was also for me, a way of thinking through if hope has been removed and if the possibility of immediate action something new to get involved in, some new group to join, some new movement to dedicate yourself to, if those have also been removed. And you're a solitary individual. So at least this person is because he has a wife somewhere, an invisible wife that he writes a letter to and he makes a reference to his two sons, but they're not anywhere there. And if he has been there for 10 years, then the hope of reuniting is also seems to be very faint. So this person is also removed from the Uh, third possibility um, or another possibility of optimism, which is the family unit, right? Which conventionally we are used to thinking of children, then grandchildren, and then this this sentence that we often hear, which is that, well, there'll be a better world for the next generation, right? And so what happens if you also don't have even that generational uh, transition hope? And my idea was that in the absence of those um, structures to give yourself hope, one of the things that gives you hope is the stories you tell yourself, right? And some of those stories are very, very repetitive. It's why he, even though he's been reading Watership Down, the Richard Adams book for 10 years, if he's been there for 10 years, he still reads it every time as if he's reading it for the first time. He stumbles on certain things. He doesn't read it with fluency. You would think that he could just close the book and recite it from memory, but he's going through every sentence in a halting way. You know, there's a point when he walks up this elevator, it's his morning exercise, and he must have done that a million times by then. And yet he stops to pick up 
a discarded ticket, right? Where you might think, but why would there be a ticket after this many years? You've surely cleaned it all. But that must mean somehow that he puts it back every day because he needs um, that ritual. So there was something about, um, I said stories in 2016, 17, when I was writing the synopsis and the script. And then later on during Jolly Dobena, I used this word prevarication, right? Which is just another way of saying, you know it's not true what you're saying. So between Tripoli and Jolly, there's this shift where this person tells himself stories, but doesn't acknowledge to us, and the film doesn't acknowledge to us necessarily that any of these are fiction. They could He could be just a day away from reuniting with his wife. And in Jolly, it's more clearly revealed that no, these are all stories, but they don't match with the reality at all. Um, so there was, I mean, after the film was made there and given the time that it premiered, which was 2017 in Greece, Greece as a juncture point for uh, the mass influx of refugees, there was a lot of reading into the film that the film was a meditation on the plight of refugees and statelessness. And you can certainly read it that way. And certainly being in an airport invites that. But it wasn't what was on my mind when I made the film. Um, you know, maybe because that airport in Athens, it's in an area next to the mountains where the mobile signals are not strong. So the whole time that we're filming, we didn't have mobile phone access, which was some sort of blessing. So we had, at least for the shooting period, uh, ability to just cut off the news of the world. But I just really thought of it as loneliness um, about a person who can be lonely in a crowd, right? Who can be in a marriage, who can seemingly go through the daily ritual of the marriage. Maybe there are even children, there's breakfast, there's taking them to school but they feel fundamentally lonely. So they're in motion all the time, but they're in some sort of bubble of their thoughts. And then what are the stories they tell themselves to keep going? Um, that that really was one of my thoughts. And then the, you know, you mentioned uh, these world historical um, events that come up in his conversation, his dialogue, you know, one is Hannah Arendt uh, and specifically, specifically about Hannah Arendt, this idea of being out of time, out of sync. I was, um, recently reading the new biography of, um, I think first comprehensive biography of Edward Said um, that's just come out. And when you read it, you realize, regardless of how much he was taken as an exemplar of the Palestinian movement, the face of Arab um, intellectual expression based in the United States or globally, there were all sorts of ways that he was actually very much not of his time. He was out of sync with all the intellectual tendencies in the Arab world and in the US, at least as far as he felt, right? I mean. There's a way that he seems to have belonged, but he didn't belong actually, um, which kind of shows. So I feel like that was also part of what I understood Hannah Arendt as being, as somebody who's out of sync with the way you're supposed to speak about the Holocaust, the way you're supposed to speak about evil as expressed in the Holocaust, the way you're supposed to speak about any of the protagonists. You know, she, she broke the decorum. Um, it's kind of forgotten now, but at the time, those were very unpopular pieces that she wrote for The New Yorker. And, you know, it's a pre-social media time. It's a time of slow media, but, you know, she um, she came close to being vilified, except things didn't happen as fast. So there'd be letters to the New Yorker and they will be somewhat genteel. And it's a New Yorker, so it's not a mass, it's not television. Um, you know, but there was a way that it was definitely not in step with the way you're um, supposed to speak about the aftermath. Uh, so that's why she comes up, you know, uh, you know, this idea that Hannah, that my, you know, that this character is somehow was a dinner guest of Hannah Arendt doesn't fit with the time. You know, he couldn't be in an airport in the 70s, um, whenever the time period that I should yeah. be a contemporary of Hannah Arendt. So th there were those things as well. And then the thing about the concentration camp is also an example of a story that doesn't fit within Holocaust narratives. Um, it's not well sourced. There's only, I think, two books that uh, have references to it. But it is this story that um, supposedly in some of the camps, if a prisoner was close to dying and was starting to fall over from hunger, then supposedly the German term used by other concentration camps was that this was he was becoming dar musulman meaning he was you know going down in prayer. But it's a metaphor weakness. I don't actually know if the story is true. It seems so. Uh, but, strange. But in uh, Agam, Agamben's bare life, he uses this. That's right. He uses he it, uses but, it but but you, productively. You know, that's right. Right. <laughs> but but if you look at the um, you know if you look at the sources that he cites and you go back to the sources, you realize that such a big claim yeah. that at the end of life, when a 
when a Jewish prisoner is dying, the state of dying and the state of surrender is somehow called becoming a Muslim. And I don't think it's a complimentary reference. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, you surrender. It's a very, it's a very odd story. And you can see why it's a, it's a, it's a difficult story for either uh, Jewish scholars or Muslim scholars to claim, because that's why I think it shows up in Agamben and then doesn't really show up in a significant way since. And just, you know, because you mentioned uh, the visual arts context, when I first came across this story, I thought of writing an academic essay about it. That's, that's what the way I thought this story should be treated because it's such an extraordinary, it can, you can read so many things into it if it's true. And then I just couldn't figure out a way to write it. Um, and so in the end, the, the liberty of a visual arts context is that I could drop it in as an aside in a film and not explain it and just leave it there. Um, but to me, it's also like a, uh, 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 an in, a, a strand of intellectual discourse that shows up in Agamben and then is kind of left alone in terms of nobody else really picks it up after that. Mm. No. We'll come to this, the, the freedom that a visual art context gives to the cinematic image. But that will will end it because I think by then the audience would be very exhausted, so we can give them a little spin. But I, I, my neck, as we come now to Jolly Devon, I think people will be getting a little troubled. We are, they have seen this film and they're supposed to see this film and they're not discussing it. We come to it. So we come to this. The first shot, you 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 kind of we opened up to a to a place, a, a place with a with a distinct materiality and almost a smell. You kind of almost smell the space, you know, and the camera, the, the camera is completely you know, open to the space. It knows that it is, it has, it is, it has in front of it a space that it has to now embrace and move and open. So, uh, and then there is the, there is that space that opens up and then we reach another abandonment or another off use, a space that has lost its use in which two subjectivity, two persona, two presences, uh, two presences, I say presences because they, 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 they work out a way of thinking about life and they are enacting themselves and they're moving themselves and we start entering a very, very endearing space of what is the nature of a conversation when time is receding away, okay. So, and what is interesting is that, like the like this work was made during the pandemic, you know. And we, at, as you know, we very well know, it was commissioned way before the pandemic. It was not commissioned in the retrospect, you know. And whenever uh, there is a lot of the time, it comes up that this is almost as if the discourse of uh, care is driving this work which is all emergent in pandemic. So, but I think the work is not about care. It is about a duration, like the work in Tripoli can say, but it's a very different kind of duration. And here I think that it is a, uh, an al al almost I would say the kind of epistemic shift in your work, because I think the female, the woman character, Sophia, changes the texture by which time is experienced in your work. Now, why I say this, she brings in an hesitancy she brings in the, the ability that time doesn't move always in the way that is imagined to move. It stutters, it blocks, and it needs a certain kind of attention, a deep alert attention to its movement that we can reach somewhere even to within ourselves. So the, if uh, this, this the, the male, the masculine, I would say, in your film, kind of in your work, I think, it has encounters itself in a very different way. Not in world historical ease, not in the way of residing in other time with a certain ease, not in the idea of finding the disconnect and being nostalgic about it. It's somewhere else it has moved. And this is where I would like to a little bit of discussion is that what does this Sophia do to your thinking? And uh, I'm asking this because I think it does a lot in the cinematic vibration that you create around her. And we'll come to two or three moments that it, it's a very, very significant uh, moments. Is what does it do to your thinking in, in terms of when you are locating a person like her with a certain kind of undefined space of 
uh, uh, undefined space in which you know that she's receding away from us. Mm-hmm. Uh, what does it do to your thinking, uh, to, to idea of the place in which she's located? Yeah. She, um, yeah, Sophia is uh, not only receding, sometimes unclear if she's there, sometimes her uh, blank look in one of the scenes is also a stand-in for the fact that we're not sure if she and Jyoti, the male character, which is an ambiguous name in terms of gender um, in Bengali, although commonly often a male name, but also can be a female name. Um, you know, she exists with Jyoti and Jyoti is trying to take on this role of being the person who solves things, right? I mean, you said it's not the large historical scope, it's the small domestic frame and they're inside this building which was formerly a hospital or perhaps is still a hospital, it's unclear. You know, he sees his role possibly as the person who will get us to the next step of the story. Um, you know, there's a scene early on where they move from bench to bench, which is a you know, common experience, of course, in hospitals of waiting and then getting elevated to the next level and then to the next level and then finally into the doctor's chamber. Um, you know, in the normal experience of that, everybody else around is actually a barrier to getting to where you're going. You might feel a competitive energy with other people there. In this staging, there is nobody else there, but they're still patiently going from bench to bench and to me um that's a way that jyoti the male protagonist um sees himself as the person who's going to take the domestic unit the couple sophia to the next place and the next place and the next place and the thing is that sophia refuses all that she's not actually there for the saving for him you know she's there's no solution to be found she actually um insists later on in the film that certain steps that are supposed to be taken within pharma medical emergency room um, care that the next steps that are supposed to happen he shouldn't do Um, and when he says but you know how can i do that because also it means to not have a role she says but think of the freedom of you know not having to do anything and to just stand back and be an inert witness or passenger And, and i think You know, Sophia is the character, Sophia is the human, of course, the person who is actually going through this unnamed uh, illness that we never define. Sophia is the person who's actually refusing chronological um, steps. You know, she doesn't want to be taken to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. She doesn't want a solution. Um, She's actually more comfortable with there being no solution. You know that this is just how it will end and there will be nothing dramatic um and i think hopefully people are watching it after the film so i'm not giving anything away by saying this um you know there there was certainly the idea i don't know how articulate it is made in the end the reason the hospital is abandoned is because the event in actual time happened a long time ago and um, jyoti is basically haunting either the hospital or the catacombs of his mind which are now set up as a projection of the hospital. Um, you know, that's why there's nothing there. That's why there's no nobody else. And so one of the things that he's doing, I think very, very sharply connected with the way Sophia exists in the world, is he's trying to have a do-over, to try to do it again, you know, to do it better, to write a different ending. So it's also refusing the way things played out. Um, Whereas Sophia, as the person who's actually inhabiting it, right? She's not the witness. She's actually fully the person who's going to experience everything, including the pain. Um, uh, let's say, presuming there's no pharma narcotic solution at the end, she's the one who says that you know this is we should just go with it at this pace, and there's no escape. And um, there's no, so they they to me felt like two ways of navigating the world. Um, I won't say hers is passive or defeatist, but hers is of you know, that which cannot be changed, I'm not going to use up the last bit of my precious energy or spirit trying to push against that anyway in a um, futile hope of changing it. So so that's, I mean, she to me was the more, um, I won't say dignified, but she's the more centered and grounded individual within that um, tableau. You know, she's the one who understands uh, you know, there's this other part again. I hope people are watching it after it after they watch the film, where they talk about the decision to come back from abroad. You know, you get the education and then 
outcome. And he's the one who is now second guessing that decision. And she's the one who is at comfort with the decision to have come back, even if that involved, you know, giving up certain things because she understands why she's done it. So th this sort of um, being at peace with decisions already made and not trying to reverse back and playing it again, she's a more centered individual within that situation. Uh, and this is very, very beautifully narrated. I, I, I think the, the there is more that the film while working the cinematic. Mm -hmm. It creates a very fascinating thing that, the, the which is a very uh, something that I learned seeing this film. Something that made me think is because I also saw the initial scenario, then the, some part of the filmmaking. What I learned is that the intimacy is something that is not a priori. Intimacy is something that is achieved. And I think in very, in a very, uh, uh, very, that this is a very fascinating cinematic document of trying to think through that question that in, there is no a priori intimacy in the name that we give to each other, friend or lover or a wife or a sister. Intimacy is in the process of a discovery always. It has to be achieved. And this, this throated situation of life, a situation of life allows us to rethink how to achieve it. So every step becomes a way to understand an article and where the non-human presence of life, non-human and the structures around which the procedures around which you are and your navigation of it and the person to whom you're bringing this works together and mm -hmm. it can divert it can it be awkwardly far away it could be hesitant it could be because the script here is unknown mm -hmm. the and that's why it has to be achieved and i thought as a film the as an artwork to me it's an artwork you through the process of the working with figures to arrive at a certain uh, fascinating place where we actually are in a very intimate space without those person being intimate, directly mm -hmm. intimate. We have been taken into an extreme space. The space is in excess to what we are seeing in the image. And I think that's something that I really, really uh, was moved by in this work. And I think something that leaves a mark to a viewer somewhere after this scene, this excess that you have entered an excess space without actually them having played it out for you. So would you think that the filmmaking uh, process allowed you to, for yourself to enter that kind of a bit unknown bit a space that you may be otherwise very shy to even write it out in a scenographic way? I mean, it's uh, uh, always, um... It's interesting to look back on this retrospectively, um, especially now there's more than a year uh, distance, because of course here uh, talking over Zoom, we are both probably giving it a more solid shape than it had at the time. A lot of things seem like, oh, this is going off track in a very dramatic way. And then, then you make peace with it going off track in a dramatic way. But then it says something that at the beginning there was perhaps a more plan than the you know the absence of a plan would have been more liberating but there was a plan and then when the plan broke more interesting things happened uh, you know you mentioned seeing it in earlier iterations and for the audience um, one of the moments that Jewish is referring to is um so just a little uh, backstory there was a decision made early on that the both actors would be relatively young so that you didn't have the escape route of um that they're older um, in fact uh, my assistant uh, director, second camera person, Moynak had, um, uh, who had worked on a short film that I didn't know at the time, but I was aware of later, where both the protagonists are quite old, right? So therefore, um, you know, in that tableau, you're used to thinking of this as being an end of life story, right? The evening song, the evening raga, etc. In Jolle, they're very visibly young, you know, they're young-ish. So therefore, there's not that escape that, uh, a terminal illness has come at when it's supposed to come. There's clearly a sense of life interrupted. And within that dynamic, in real life, um, Kea is, uh, Kea Chattopadhyay, the actress, is younger than Shagnik Mukherjee, the actor. And not just younger age-wise, but younger in terms of um, theater seniority. 
Um, and so the thing I noticed on the first day on set, which I didn't realize at the time, because I think if this was in Bangladesh, I would be more tuned into this. And I wasn't in the Kolkata context until shooting started, is that she calls him uh, Shag um, you know, which of course, absolutely, when the camera's off. And, you know, Da is fine, you know, it's a term of respect, can be a term of endearment. But in my mind from day one, this was sort of like a problem. I saw it as a problem. Nobody else seemed to have even noticed it, that their husband wife but she's calling him da as soon as the camera is off and i kept wondering if that you know older brother relationship was infused into the acting itself and so i mean i don't like to overly direct and i just sort of let it flow um and organically i think the way it played out they were not very physically affectionate right and the, i think if they were physically it would have been artificial as well because you'd have seen that if off camera it's not coming on camera the jump would be clear so uh, there's a way that it all works out in our head because there's a scene in the balcony where they're having tea and there's a little bit of gap between them and they don't do the sort of leaning on each other at the end or any of that which we might be tuned to thinking about from a different kind of uh story setup and then when i'm looking at those scenes I'm wishing for the affection that didn't organically happen. And to me, I saw initially, so it as, huh, really they're sort of at an end of life situation and they're still not holding each other very often. Um, what do I do with this? Do I shoot this again? Or do I allow this to be, should this just be the way it was? And then I was in Delhi with the rushes on my hard drive and uh, I sat down with you, Jibesh, at the studio. And I remember showing you those, just those rushes with the sound still unlayered and just kind of starting out by saying well you can see that and I didn't say it's a problem but it was clear that I was hesitant about it. and I think Jibesh you were the one and thank you for this who said well you know there's this absence of physical intimacy as we may is there it's indicating something else as well right it might indicate something about the status of the relationship it might indicate something also about what we uh, think of as visible affection and what others might think of as sufficient affection um, and the gap between that. Uh, there's also this idea that an end of life situation breaks you out of the norm and into somewhere else. Uh, but maybe that's also a projection. Um, you know, it's a completely different uh, topic, but just because I watched it recently, there's an um, American detective thriller TV series procedural on one of the channels. And uh, one of the characters is a detective um, named Bosch and he has a daughter and his wife has been murdered. And every scene where they're talking on the phone ends with a very perfunctory, I love you. They both say, I love you very quickly and hang up. It's almost like goodbye, right? And I'm not making a commentary about whether that's genuine or not, but there's I love you in every single dialogue said so quickly that I, I'm not going to say it loses meaning. I'm sure it has all the meaning, but it's a different way of in constantly expressing, right? Um, and this was their way of taking care of each other in a very vulnerable moment. And I think what it reveals more is that in my psyche, somehow I expect something else to happen. And organically, that's not what happens in these moments. Um, and, you know, intimacy in end of life situations is, I think, also uh, uh, some sort of mythos that we've now been raised to expect it's it's seen as more authentic somehow and perhaps somehow you get to the more authentic place when you know it's the end or everything has been removed and maybe that itself is an idea that could be questioned yeah very well said uh, I, i'll just uh, about intimacy and there's, there's two uh, now we are we should uh, wind up very soon about intimacy i would say in the united uh, red army there is this uh, brilliant sequence, and I, I think we can insert it here, uh, that where the uh, negotiator from the side of Bangladesh is saying that you have forgotten me. Uh, <laughs> and it's, and a it's, a, <laughs> it, it's a fantastic movie dialogue that you have moved on and you have forgotten me, and obviously, and he doesn't understand. The oh. hijack, hijacker doesn't understand. Thank you, Sue. This is uh, Dr. Dawood. Phoenix. Phoenix, you can't get it. Phoenix. Now, after you have got your friends, you have forgotten me. I said, now that you have got your friends, you have forgotten me. You have not called me up, or have you? I have told it. I have received 
So this idea, and and in the middle, uh, the that in, the, the, in this great world historical turbulence of transformation of the aviation history to transformation of history within Japan, transformation of history within Bangladesh, you have this incredibly intimate sub intimate moment of two people desperately trying to connect. One person even sure that he has connected, and then that it, moment. So and then there is this beautiful line that things will remain unanswered things mm. remain unanswered it is, not, it is not necessary to understand everything yeah and the, so that that sense of i think that jolly Dovena draws from those moments the, the draws from currents that are out in those moments where there is that understanding and expression are always in in some kind of fluctuation and desyncing and sinking and mm. the second i think the what is interesting is there is I think I think I have two more points. One is the the status of the court in uh, Tripoli Council, and the court and the inner and the kind of burst of dance. You know, uh, the the court is uh, something that is hang. The court is kept folded, kept kept side again put. So court is the there is a kind of a comfort. And there's also discard, a comfort and a discard. It while the dance has to take over, the court has to give way, but it stays as a scribble in the landscape. But then it has to also come back to comfort. It's like this kind of I always found the shawl in your Jolly Dovona's character. So uh, a little Jyoti's body, a bit uh, always. I, I thought he doesn't. He doesn't kind of. He's kind of wrapped himself up in a comfort of a culture which he doesn't want to get out of and always kind of been pushed out so it's a it's the coat and the shawl as an interesting thing and this burst of the energy with the with the sequence with the wheelchair and it's, for me it is the the, the dance sequence of with babylon in uh, tripoli but what it does is that it ex, it moves away from any explanatory paradigm of of time of uh, expression of time in a sense that it it is it is kind of unregulated in in its way it appears in the image and the and and the work never kind of uh, absorbs it it just throws it into the air it strikes you like a like a almost like a thunderbolt you are just completely taken up by it but it doesn't it doesn't need it doesn't need work with it into the films it just it appears it bursts and then it moves ahead Yeah, I mean, the dance is definitely his one moment of freedom where he goes outside of his regimented daily routine because most of his daily routine in Tripoli Cancel is also a bit of drudgery. Even reading the book seems like a task, right? Especially because of the way he reads it. He reads in a very stumbling way. And then uh, there was the real life analog, which is that um, uh, that song was one of my father's favorites. And um, it's one of those, I've never really adequately understood why those two bands, uh, Bonnie M and ABBA, were so popular in South Asia at that time, pushing aside every other contender. Maybe Cliff Richard was the only other person who was also popular. No, it was not. It was Bonnie M and ABBA was there. Yeah, so it was just sort of like in a world, in a dominating way in Bangladesh where you know, when I came to the US for college, I just presumed that those were the two touchstones of everybody's 1970s existence and found out, well, especially Bonnie M is virtually unknown in the US, except for certain countries. So there's also some sort of like uh, immigrant meta narrative there, uh, perhaps because Bonnie M is also this uh, strange fiction because they're four, uh, you know, 
um, German African performers who are fronting the voice for a white musician uh, who later is also behind Milli Vanilli, I think many years later. And then at some point they break off and decide to be their own independent. We're not going to sing your words anymore. But once that happens, then the success also disappears. So that maybe have something to do with the industry. So there's this strange uh, band, but they were the ones that, I mean, my father wasn't very into popular music in a very huge way, but this was one band he really liked. And so, I, and he wasn't a dancer at all. He was quite, you know, stiff in his composure but i always feel like this was the one thing that he would dance to if he could dance and so the instruction to the actor was also to you know to dance in a very stiff way but of course he couldn't control himself so he ended up dancing just as the way he dances so it's it's like it's not only a moment of exuberance it's a moment of exuberance there are a few in tripoli cancel where he didn't follow the script um you know so again i hope people see this only after watching <laughs> Tripoli Cancel. Yes, they need to see it after watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a bit at the end where he was, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a few other parts where this is the way it was supposed to be. And then when the camera was rolling, he just did his own thing. And he did it in such a way that you couldn't then say, no, no, let's go back to what I did, because that he had done with so much heart. Um, and you knew that the scripted version that you wanted to do, if he did, he wouldn't, it would be more um, performative. And then, yeah, in, um, in uh, Jolly Do Bena, it's, it's of course a moment of exuberance. Um, it's probably slightly influenced by memories of other films. Although when I recently rewatched it, I don't know if there is a scene like this. I think somewhere in the back of my mind, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest um, by Milos Forman was in my head. But when I watched it recently, I don't know if there was a wheelchair scene like that. So I might have imagined it. Um, but, but one was that thing of like sort of bursting free of the constraints of a hospital where you're supposed to go from A to B to C. Another one is that her sort of finally pushing back and saying, stop being around me as if you're writing my eulogy in your head. Right? I'm still around. And, and so it was, it, you know, it, it was on her part, this thing of saying, I'm the one who has a terminal illness. You actually don't have the right to be so morose um, or so down and dead in your energy. Whereas, of course, as we know, the caregivers have to deal with the fact that they're the ones um, left behind, right? I mean, the the person going through something like this has the at least the path of leaving, of departure, of exit. And the person who will stay will stay with that which they have to make sense of. So it's a break from that. It was a rupture from that as well. So it's great. So we have this rupture. So we stay with this rupture. We've already done 51 minutes and best of luck for producing more ruptures in our imagination of the world. Look forward um, to working with you more in the future. Yeah. And we really look forward. Great. Yeah. And thank you, by the way, in case I didn't get a chance to say it, I'll say it now. Thank you so much on behalf of everybody participating in the triennial for not postponing it because yeah, that was yeah. our you know, sanity structure during the pandemic months of this triennial has not been cancelled. So I'll continue making the work and premiering it where everything else shut down. It was, a, it was, I it was I'm happy. That, I'm happy that we, we continued with it. And, and it was a very specific case in Japan. So and then they have, they have a more different attitude to the whole thing. So it was great. And uh, we could have talked another hour, but People, I think, have important things to do. So we will wind up and hope to catch up sometime again. And thank, thank you, DIFF, for arranging this.